Well, we, we talked about involving uh, different healthcare providers uh, in the care of these patients. Gary, what's the role of the multidisciplinary team in treating medullary thyroid cancer? Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's the only way to treat it. Um, even the earliest cases, because the multidisciplinary team is really very broad. Uh, we've been talking a lot, and we haven't mentioned very much about diagnostic imaging, but they're a very integral component of this team. And even I was just thinking about the conversations that were going on. You know, many of these patients have had multiple therapies. Surgery, sometimes one, sometimes on multiple occasions, one or two systemic therapies. And how are we imaging them? For example, the medullary thyroid cancer patients, in imaging the neck, uh, we have to think about what, what we're trying to look for. Mm -hmm. um, Many medical oncologists are really not comfortable with diagnostic ultrasound, but diagnostic ultrasound is a critical component of the continued surveillance of these patients because even if they have no disease in their neck on the initiation of therapy, even with progression of distant disease, they may develop disease in their neck again. And on cross-sectional imaging, it may be totally missed, uh, especially if they've had multiple surgeries, they've lost all their fat planes, and not until it's very, very destructive and aggressive in its process. On the other side of this, uh, we also have to realize that sometimes we diagnose disease and we may not even want to know that they're there. It may be a five millimeter deposit in the lateral neck. We do, I, I said that facetiously, we want to know that it's there, but we, we don't want to be exuberant about our understanding of it. I sort of go back 25 years ago when I entered this field, and we, you know, if they had disease in their neck, we were operating on them. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, and I don't want to say that we're cavalier about it, but we're a little bit zeal less zealous in our approach. We, we see these patients, and we're, we're comfortable observing disease because we know that surgery will be effective for that one lump but may not be very effective in their overall management. So we can understand where the safe areas are and where the unsafe areas are. When Marsha mentioned about fistulas, sometimes these can be handled prospectively with a surgical intervention. Mm -hmm. uh, we can eradicate the disease, at least locally in that area, uh, so that fistula is not a significant concern. Uh, sometimes that surgery is not reasonable in the grand scope of the patient. So it really does require all of us to be involved. And that is medical oncologists. It may be plastic surgeons, may be speech language pathologists. I mean, the interdisciplinary team is broad. I, Gary, I have a question for you. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, debulking, I know some of the patients will present to us first because they have you know, disseminated disease and they've never seen a surgeon. You know, it was someone who was picked up by the primary care doctor. Um, I oftentimes, after you know, the workup and the CEAs and calcitonin uh, baseline levels, I'll send them to the surgeon for consideration for debulking. I'm just curious to know what your opinion is regarding Okay, I option. hate the term debulking. I was going to say that. <laughs> 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 so debulking from a surgical oncology standpoint means removing the disease that we're looking at or feeling at or radiographically appreciating, but in an incomplete fashion. In, in the cervical area, that's really not very palatable. But when you're talking about in a systemic patient, Debulking from an extirpative standpoint, meaning having a, a complete local regional extirpation of disease, may be a very, very effective therapy. We think about patients that present with medullary thyroid carcinoma and they present with a calcitonin in the 10,000 to 20,000 range. And they have very significant local regional disease. I know even if I have them comprehensively evaluated from a distance standpoint, and there's no disease. My comfort level that they're going to remain, even if I have complete extirpation of disease, quote unquote tumor free margins, which I'm really not sure what that's going to mean in that patient. My concern of lifelong control of that disease is very, very high. And so uh, they need to be systemically evaluated. At first, the absence of systemic disease does not mean this patient does not have systemic disease. Really speaking time. again to, to the importance of, of getting everybody involved. 
Marcia, you had a comment. I, I just had a comment about the black box warning because I had patients who actually died so that, that led to this black box warning with cabozantinib. I just want to clarify, these patients had no measurable disease in their neck. So they didn't die because they had disease that we knew about. And, and I talked to the surgeon and he said, you know, I could have predicted that. And I said, why? He said, because it was very closely in the TE groove. There, you know, we pulled out as much as we could and it never grew back. We never actually had it, but it likely was in the wall. And so I think that you, just because they don't have bulky disease in the neck, I think that if you're gonna treat cabozantinib and they were in that TE groove initially, um, even if there's no disease, I think a discussion with the surgeon because those, that, the person who passed away on our trial was somebody like this with no measurable disease. I just wanted to clarify that because it's a little unsettling that it's not something you could see now. You actually have to talk to the surgeon. And it's so such it's, a, I'm sorry. Speaks to um, the, the fact that most of these uh, adverse events are manageable, but there can be some serious adverse events with, with these agents. Let's talk about the situation, Manisha, where a patient has had cabozantinib, a patient has had bendetinib. Um, what do you do after they progress on those two agents? So again, I go back to see if they really need therapy right now, uh, you know, and if there is any role of local regional therapy such as radiation for palliation or surgery and so forth. But if they do need systemic therapy, well, for liver metastasis, we also look at the hepatic artery chemobilization as a potential option. So, so there are several non-systemic therapies that could be effective because uh, there is not really third line uh, therapy that's carved out for these, these patients or progression after bo both FDA approved therapies. So there are other phase two trials with the TKI such as pazopinib or sorafenib that have shown some efficacy. So you could pick one of them and try. Uh, but we always go back to clinical trials and see if that's you know something that uh, is possible. Uh, we will also look at their genotype profile and see if there is anything there that we can work on. So there are a few clinical trials that are around that, that we are using currently. And, and again, both uh, cabozantinib and vendetinib are, of course, approved drugs for the treatment of medullary thyroid cancer. Frank, how do you use the uh, pharma-sponsored patient assistant programs in the treatment of these patients? Yeah, so um, we at our center, um, refer all our patients to the outpatient um, cancer center pharmacy at Michigan. And um, they will pre-screen all the, the patients for pre-authorization. And um, depending on you know, their insurance and, and coverage, we'll then contact the patient's assistance programs. And I found them actually very helpful. They're very interested in wanting to follow the patients um, and are interested in their side effect profiles and those kinds of things. So that's how we do it. We talk to the nurse, the nurse talks to the pharmacist, and then every patient screened through our pharmacy up front.